Welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Wayne DeFermery. I'm a professor of uh, information science and entrepreneurship at Dominican University of California, and I'm today's moderator, um, also one of today's presenters. Um, so I'm going to, we are working on a project uh, related to a small to medium sized local archive in Daegu, South Korea, uh, which is associated with the national debt redemption movement, um, uh, a movement. Uh, to repay um, uh, national debt in early 20th century Korea. Um, and so we'll be talking about not that movement as much as the archive uh, that we've been interested in um, making available to people uh, both in Korea and to the rest of the world. So with that very short introduction and I'll pass the um, mouse to you and let you take it from here. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Wayne. Let me get set up here. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Anne Gilliland. I am a professor in the Department of Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and my area is archival studies and uh, Hence, why I'm working on this project. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my presence and the presence of the University of California, Los Angeles, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Gabrielino Tongvit peoples. So, my role today, I'm just going to be very brief, um, is really to introduce some of the um, concerns and considerations that we have been thinking about with the development of this archive and particularly with the metadata aspects of the archive. So I'm going to see if I can get to, uh -huh, there we are, another page here. And uh, so as uh, Wayne um, indicated a minute ago, the NDRMA, the National Debt Redemption Movement Archive, um, is a national repository in Daegu, South Korea, um, that has close community connections um, locally within Korea, um, but at the same time, it's seeking to develop a global profile and utilization for scholarship um, as a model and in educational activities as well. So in thinking about metadata and what this archive needs to be able to do and to support, um, I approach this from thinking about the, a lot of the principles that are increasingly driving contemporary archival practices and those principles are drawn both on critical approaches and also community archives approaches. And, and this is a rather unusual archive because it straddles many different modalities and it also um, straddles a long period of time and a lot of um, generational difference. So in thinking about the kinds of principles um, that we have to take into consideration, the first of those is um, community participation and community centricity and just how central um, would community or should community participation be and the first question that this begs is you know what is a community in this context and who would be the relevant and the most appropriate communities to engage with um, in this endeavor and having identified that how could they most appropriately and effectively be engaged if we were designing a fully community archive it would be generated directly out of the uh, out of the community and the community would be driving it in this case it this is an archive that has national standing um, and international aspirations but it is definitely um, relevant to individual um, koreans and different local commun korean communities and a third consideration would be how we do take into account generational differences and also potential political differences within populations. A second issue is 
how to ensure that we are culturally sensitive and culturally responsive in what we're doing. Um, the moment you straddle communities and the moment you straddle local to global, um, you've got to ask questions about whether the, the metadata you're using, and particularly if you're using standards that were developed outside of the space that you're working in, whether those are appropriate and whether even if they are, are they sufficient on their own? Um, a third thing actually has to do with what you are willing to make available globally or more widely. Are there questions about um, sensitivity of some of the materials or does the community wish some material to be kept and made available locally rather than on a wider basis? So the question is, should all content be equally available? A question that archivists are, are very familiar with. And if the answer to that is no, then what kind of structural metadata do you need to facilitate that? And the fourth question is how an archive of this type can support multiple and possibly even competing perspectives and narratives and at the same time, whether or not it can assist in surfacing um, submerged narratives or new narratives altogether, and whether standardized metadata can do that or whether you need to develop some local ontologies to support that. Um, and then uh, this sort of leads into my next, next slide, whether or not um, it's going to be easy for your different types of metadata to interface in order to support this. There we are. So pursuing that question, um, the kinds of different metadata that we might have might be uh, parallel metadata that addresses the same content, but discuss, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, discusses <coughs> discusses it um, in different ways or reflects different interpretations. <coughs> Something that's quite likely when you're crossing time and space with archival materials. A second point here is um, whether you're going to allow people who use the archives to contribute metadata, maybe by tagging content um, maybe by coming up with whole different annotations um, <coughs> or even contributing additional content themselves. And the third aspect, if this is going to be used in education, do you need to integrate educational um, metadata sets as well that help both um, teachers and students not only find the material, but interpret it and integrate it into lessons and lesson planning and learning activities. If you're going to have um, these kinds of uh, um, complicated metadata in place, how are you going to make sure you have a completely confused users, particularly users who are not scholarly users and might have less knowledge of the topic? and the various actors who are involved and their contexts. Um, so how do you embed sufficient context in there and scaffold the system um, accordingly? And as you do that, how do you also ensure archival accountability and transparency regarding the decisions you've made about how people move through the material? And then how do you evaluate all of these things to make sure that they're actually working the way that they, they need to work? And the final few points here, um, before I turn it back to Wayne, um, in what language is your metadata going to be created? If the source material is in Korean, um, and if you are going to create metadata in multiple languages so that you can reach out outside of Korea, how can you ensure on the one hand, semantic equivalency between your metadata, or on the other hand, that metadata is actually tailored to the, um, 
the cultural environment and the kinds of needs that other audiences might have of the materials. Um, how do we make um, that language also relevant, which is always an archives problem, to changing communities and generations and different histories? Um, how do you get around um, the problem of sort of contested language or archaic language and offensive terms that might be in there? And finally, who's going to own your metadata, especially if it is in, in contributed by others other than the archive developers, and whether um, you actually have to completely rely on um, all of these kinds of metadata or whether linked open data could also address some of these questions. So I'm going to turn it back now to Wayne, who's going to introduce this case further. Thanks so much, Anne. That was perfect. Let me get my slides up and going. Um, all righty. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, I, um, I, I'm going to follow up in many ways on what Anne was uh, just talking about. Uh, Although right now my official title is Professor of Information Science and Entrepreneurship, I worked for a decade as a professor of Global Korean Studies. And while that, is, that might seem quite the juxtaposition, a lot of my research um, has dealt with uh, older books, uh, Korean history and Korean literature. Um, James Turner, who's a historian at the University of Notre Dame, suggests that the modern discipline of history is grounded uh, by the study of an interpretation of documents. Um, his basic idea, and this is one that's shared by all, lots of people, is that documents are the sort of foundational components um, that help us to write our histories and, and create history. So when we're thinking about archives, um, how we describe those documents uh, can very much shape the ways that we can write history and describe places and times. Um, the history that we're, the archive records and it is used to sort of support in terms of its history telling is often one which is based on nation states and especially sort of imperialist uh, practices and um, other sorts of things that were going on in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Commodore Perry arriving in Japan uh, in the 1850s to open up Japan to trade basically at gunpoint. Uh, the Japanese turning around um, and doing very much a similar kind of thing to open up trade uh, in Korea, a sort of contest for Korea um, in East Asia as a place to be sort of colonized um, and Japan eventually colonizing Korea. And in the process, and this is the national debt redemption movement, this is where it's sort of situated in time and space, um, two gentlemen, Sa Sang Don and Kim Kwang Jae uh, in Tegu, who decided um, because the Japanese had basically indebted uh, Korea to the rest of the world and especially to Japan, that they would work together with people in their community uh, and around actually a good portion of Korea to repay that debt, um, hence the national debt redemption movement. Um, and then this archive uh, is situated these days and, and it's memorialized uh, in Tegu, um, uh, a city uh, in this uh, sort of southern part, south central part of South Korea. Uh, Historiography, this is the sort of idea that uh, of how histories are, are composed, um, concerns the kind of framing questions that, that sort of set up how we're gonna write uh, history. So Confucian historiography, for example, will focus on Confucian principles as a sort of framing principle and will often focus on how rulers have behaved so that later rulers can then use sort of the history that has been written as a kind of mirror for making judgments. Of course, there's lots of other kinds of um, historical framings, um, historiographical approaches. Um, and uh, one of them, for example, is a focus on uh, minjung in Korean, uh, sort of a focus historiographically on, quote, the people. Uh, the people, of course, understood as Korean. And the idea of not focusing on sort of monarchs or other kinds of people, but focusing on framing histories in terms of writing about every, quote, everyday people's lives. 
nationalist historiographies have often formulated um, Korean history. And in, um, in a really well-known essay, uh, Carter Eckert, uh, who's a uh, historian uh, at Harvard, uh, in a book, in an essay called Exercising Hegel's Ghosts uh, Toward a Post-Nationalist Historiography of Korea, uh, he, he basically argued uh, for, quote, excising, <laughs> or exor you know, getting rid of uh, Hegelian ideas. Uh, the exorcism of Hegel's ghost from Korean history uh, became a kind of conceit for him. Uh, Hegel, he writes, uh, whose intellectual influence proved in time to be as profound in East Asia as in Europe, regarded nation states as the vehicles of reason and freedom in the universal progress of world history. And I apologize for the construction going on behind me. <laughs> it's really quite noisy and distracting. Um, the Hegelian view was in fact quite unequivocal on this point. No nation state meant no freedom and no history. So Eckert's essay provokes um, a, a question, a historiographical question, how does one write history histories of Korea that do not center the nation state and rely on nationalistic ideologies. And his answer in part was to sort of reframe, get rid of Hegel, <laughs> excise Hegel's ghost from, Korean, from Korean history writing uh, so that the nation state uh, was not so central in the writing of um, the histories of Korea. Uh, from a historiographical point of view, Eckert's arguments were quite persuasive and a lot of historians have been working to sort of write from different angles and present Korean history in sort of different ways. But the exorcism of, of, of a ghost, uh, something like Hegel's from the Korean archives, especially the ones that we're dealing with, I think pose, um, as Anne was talking about, some very, some very practical problems uh, and raises actually a number of sort of ethical quandaries. Um, so in my own sort of anecdotal experience with the archive, um, and my sense of it is that a, that a deep national pride actually animates the archive. There's a great deal of, um, um, sort of deep respect for the for the movement itself in the early 20th century, um, a sense that 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 this really did help sort of found and sustain the Korean nation. Sort of animates the the documents. It helps to organize them. It helps to sort of you know, do things like um, contribute to the ways that people think about metadata and things like this. After all, the archive itself has also been registered by UNESCO as part of the Memory of the World project. UNESCO itself was of course organized as an international order, where again, nation states are quite uh, important to uh, its framing. Um, so I, I, I wonder, I have a lot of questions that sort of arise from this. On the one hand, we would wish to have stories of Korea come out in perhaps less nationalist, fr framed um, not so much by the nation, but at the same time, that same sort of sense of national pride animates the uh, archive, which like I said, I think raises a number of, uh, interesting ethical um, and practical dilemmas. What ethical responsibilities do we have as advocates for the archive when it comes to making alternative histories, um, ones less dependent on national framings available to the Korean and because this is the aspiration of the archive to the international uh, public. Um, by celebrating and enabling access to the archive, do we overlook the inequalities, for example, of international financing systems? The international finance financing system in the early 20th century that sort of created the problems that people in Korea tried to overcome uh, in many ways are, are still with us, the inequalities of those systems. Um, so how do we recognize things like that uh, as we do our work to show how people in the past have, have come up against them and, and in many ways overcome some of these inequalities? What ethical responsibilities do we have as advocates for the archive when it comes to reinforcing the real sense that I said of national pride um, that motivates um, our desire to share uh, the archive uh, with not only people in Korea, but with others around the world. And how do we overcome the real problems um, when documents are framed through metadata and other sorts of schema uh, and technologies? Um, you know, how do we think about and make these documents available to people who might not be interested in Korea or have a deep relationship with Korea in the first place and might not, on the face of it, uh, be interested uh, because it because these documents might tell the story of sort of Korea's history as a nation. Um, where Carter Eckert could argue quite persuasively as a historian um, that we should excise Hegel's ghost uh, from our ways of writing about Korean history, I'm not sure we'd wish to do so in our work um, 
in relation to the archive as we think about how to formulate its metadata uh, and make it available to people in Korea uh, and around the world. As I said, a lot of the Hegelian ghosts actually remain and um, animate in, in powerful and important ways um, what the archive is about. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure it's a good idea uh, that we um, really try to answer these questions um, that I've posed. And indeed, I, I haven't. <laughs> I'm not sure it's our job. But what, what I do think our job is to have questions like these really at the forefront of our minds as we contribute to and think about formulating the archives so that others can have the freedom to write their own histories uh, with the documents that are in the archive and the freedom to debate how such history should be written. Uh, I think we would wish um, to help others uh, understand what's in the archive, uh, historians or not, but to give them a place to explore and to learn and answer their own questions. Um, in short, I think it's important for us to have these kinds of questions um, at the forefront of our mind because the, the choices we make about things like metadata schema will shape the nature of the freedom people have when they're in the archive. It'll shape the nature of the kinds of histories that people can write. Uh, and so even if we might not have, or might even not, it might not even be our job to answer these questions, we need to have them, I think, in the forefront of them, in our mind uh, so that um, as we create and work with the archive, uh, people in Korea uh, and out uh, can find and find useful uh, what's in these documents. And with that, I'll, I'll end and stop sharing. And thank you very much. And again, apologize for the noise in the background. <laughs> up, up next, Sophie, I think you'll be, uh, or I guess we're hearing, uh, we'll, we'll get your recorded uh, remarks and then um, yeah, have you for the Q&A period, I think. So jae if you could start that video, that would be awesome. No, jae is going to play it. Yeah. Good day, everyone. This presentation will use the archival database of name and biographies, DMV, as as an example to demonstrate how to transform data silos into data commons by a linked open data approach to facilitate research inquiries and enhance engagement in digital humanities. The DMB database contains more than 35,000 records of Chinese historical persons who are cultural and socio-political elites in late imperial China. The archival database is extracted from various historical archives for supporting the historian research. Each record includes different properties of a person. For example, name, alternative name, days of birth, death, native place, Biography data, work experiences, related person, specialties, academic background, job title, and references. Each property value will connect to its original source of the archival materials. The focus of the study is to transform these DEXI metadata records into link open data set. The study has developed a link open data life, life cycle framework, which composed of 12 steps as a methodology to transform the archival database of name and biographies from data silos into data commons. In this talk, I will especially explain and demonstrate the step four data modeling, step six data reconciliation, step seven data enrichment, and step nine data queries in Sparkle. In addition, FAIR principles is applied during the conver conversion of this database into the link open data sets. FAIR principles is the current important guidance to create and publish digital assets aiming at improving 
the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability between the data sets. The implementation process of FAIR principle, known as verification process, in the link the open data set is also regarded as a life cycle like working procedure, which can be applied for the con conversion of the traditional database into linked data based data sets. We can see clearly both the link open data life cycle model and FAIR principles share a similar stepwise structure and could be aligned to each other. In this study, we include the fairness process into the link open data lifecycle framework. In, this, in the rest of the slide, I would like to highlight how we model, reconcile, enrich, and semantic query the data set. Modeling the data in semantic framework the original data of the historical person names in the DMB data set is structured in a typical field-based formal and stored in a relational database. All the data value of each field is stream literal rather than an identifier for a thing. We transform those field data into a semantic framework and each data information should be described as a triple, which is formulated as a structure of subject, predicate object, to enable the access by machine. To realize of this process, it's important to design a semantic data model as guidance to convert different type of information and make those data linkable with each other. Therefore, we have developed a DMB data model to describe the personal data collected in the archival database. In this ontological design, person and event, place, object, and time related to a person are designed as core classes in the model. There are totally six, seven properties from 16 semantic vocabularies are adopted to describe the data on the labs of the Chinese historical figures. What external resources does the data set link? and how to refer to these resources. Based on the design data model, property values will be reconciled and enriched with external resources to extend the original data by using specific properties, such as our, same as, or RDFS, see also. In terms of external resources, Three types of external resources have been referred to enrich the figure's information of the database. First, using the other LOD set of generic content, such as DBpedia. Second, linking the other LOD set of academic or professional data, which including VIAF. Third, linking the non-LOD-based data resources, such as Harvard University's TGAs. After converting the original database to, to the link open data set, we began to develop a list of template-based Sparkle questions as example to demonstrate how to query the data set. In the Sparkle query, each part or multi-parts of the SPO data triple 
could be asked as template for acquiring the answers. Each formulated question is designed after the interview of historians. From the table of the slide, we can see 14 queries are generated and can be classified to six types of questions regarding historical research, including basic query, social relations, social mobility. Furthermore, we developed a Sparkle endpoint. Users can select different query templates and download the query result. Users query result can be presented in different type of data visualization, such as statistic, charts, or shown on a historical GIS map to give the result or data interpretation in the angle of distant reading, which can clearly offer, offer a spatial and temporal distribution or a location of the query's results and might inspire a new perspective for the future study. User queries across different data sets can be undertaken and user can acquire more knowledge extracted from other open released external resources. Data of the internal and external resources can be retrieved, retrieved and presented at the same time, which revealed a smarter way of data consumption than the retrieval of traditional databases. For instance, the query shown in this slide to find different name types of a specific person, both in the data set of DMB and VF. A closing remark, as conclusion in this case study, I give a showcase to demonstrate how to transform the archival database into a link open database data set, which can not only improve the interoperability by linking with other external resources and enrich the original data content, but more important is to release and open the data to enhance scholars in digital humanities research and break the fence of each single knowledge silo. The realization process of the entire LOD life cycle in this case study has represented a practical approach to sharing the data and knowledge to the public. From the step of data modeling to the query in the barcode endpoint, where users can access and download the query data to achieve purpose of resources sharing. As responsibility of the data owner and publisher to keep free and accessible use of the data and maintain its related infrastructure are the basic tasks centered on this topic. In addition to adopt the fair principles to improve data quality, both in the metadata level and the collection level is another matter to carry out the responsibility of the data publisher that are exactly the next step we should realize in future. Well, this is all my presentation and thank you for your listening. Thanks so much, Sophie. That was fantastic. Uh, Sam, you're up next. If you could briefly introduce yourself, although I, I, in this crowd, I doubt you need an introduction. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll let you take it from here. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, and this is Sam Oh. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus from the Sungyeonggwan University, Korea, a current DCMI executive director. And already uh, many mentioned about the National Debt Redemption Movement, but I take this as the one of a representative institution of sharing and responsibility. So we are very interested in, in the really connecting to other organizations around the world that exemplifies of the in a good case of the sharing and responsibility. And the uh, UNESCO Memory World Project Korea has a 17 of them, uh, 16 are, are resignated and the archive of this national debt redemption movement is one of them. And uh, in the, in, when this, uh, that happened and uh, many Koreans um, for the first time, actually women got together and uh, they were really uh, helped uh, Korea uh, to, uh, to pay off this debt. And uh, some people uh, quit smoking and uh, uh, alcohols and uh, seen from, the, uh, from abroad and uh, many uh, the wonderful examples. And uh, so the, the, our desire is to next year to find uh, many good examples from around the world of this sharing and responsibility and the small local archives so that we can not only connect, build a network so that we can learn from the past to come back to global crisis. And that is the direction we want to go. And we have that in mind so that how we can design um, the metadata in such a way uh, we can and uh, really share the data easily. And uh, many of the concerns raised by Wayne and Anne and uh, how we can address those things uh, sensitively and with the flexibility and multiple perspective and all of that. And so the, <clears throat> we, all, uh, we all know very well, and the many heritage institutions would like their collections to be open and reusable. And, uh, and they are very careful in selecting digitizing, ingest and data management and appraisal and preservations and providing access and service. And, uh, and the, each local archives, um, the, uh, many uh, does their own way and it's not easy to share the data. And so we want to investigate and, uh, and already uh, Sophie mentioned, and is it fair, is it findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And this as a kind of a key concept and this fair principles is already uh, the mentioned by the Sophie. So I'm not going to go over those but this will be a uh, you know, verification, will be important principle we want to adopt. And so, and considering this, there are uh, quite a few already internet standards available. And the, the, so um, the ISADs and all these uh, archive related standards, we want to investigate them and to find EADs and EAC and CDAC CRMs. Uh, but uh, the small archives, what is really appropriate as a standard way to share the data and describe the data and manage the data. And we want to look at this also uh, uh, consider uh, METS, uh, 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 the kind of packaging uh, uh, to, to see and we are able to uh, really uh, find a way to accommodate many different perspectives and different uses and context. I think uh, the methods potentially has uh, a capability of doing so. And so we will be um, kind of our team will agonize over this and uh, want to have a really forum and discussion session and. Uh, around the uh, globe and also the many, uh, you know, many people and uh, who are working in the in small archives. 
And so the, we want to all share through the uh, Wikidata and the DBpedia and other organizations. And uh, so we want to develop a good kind of ontology and schema so that, we, that will allow us to uh, easily share our data across the globe. And with that in mind, I think that I am a short presentation and uh, I will entertain questions later. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, really another fine presentation. Karen, uh, I'll pass the mouse over to you. With the okay, great, thank you. Let me share here. And do, are you seeing my screen? Sorry, I can't tell. Oops. Aha, uh -huh, I see. I missed one button because it was off the screen. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, Sam gave me the perfect sort of introduction to what I'm going to talk about, which is not so much about the um, Korean archive project, but instead about a project that we've been working on in Dublin Core. And one of the things that you may have noticed, um, by the way, I'm a librarian, so I come from the the MARC world, a world where having two or 3,000 data elements in your metadata seems normal. Um, and libraries and the, the GLAM organizations basically are quite good at developing strong, well-structured metadata. What we're not so good at, and I, we have yet to find anybody other than Dublin Core that does this, which is helping people who are just getting beginning with their metadata. So Dublin Core has this project that they're calling DC Tap, which is the tabular application profile. And in case you're wondering why tabular, one of the things that we've discovered and which you may notice as you uh, travel around the, uh, the GLAM metadata world is that many people express their metadata as tables. It seems to be a very convenient human way for us to talk about what, our, what we think our data is gonna, gonna do for us and, um, and what it looks like. So we took this tabular concept and thought about what are the, the basic elements that we need to help people create a machine actionable, but very human readable version of their metadata. So um, the idea of, of it being machine actionable, but we are finding that it also works very well helping people as kind of a, a, a worksheet to uh, help them focus in on what they want to define as their metadata. And very easily we can move from a table format to this structured table format. We tried to get as many functions into this project as we can. Um, you can list your properties. You can say quite a bit about it, like what the cardinality is, uh, you know, whether it's mandatory, whether it's repeatable, what your data types are, and additional information. It has labels and notes. It, um, you can group your properties so that you're, you can group, let's say, if you are describing different entities like books and authors, those can be uh, expressed. We did design it with RDF metadata in mind, but it doesn't require that your data be RDF. And we ended up with all of 12 elements. So it's very simple. We hope it's relatively intuitive. And, um, and it seems to cover quite a few of the things that you need to think about when doing your metadata. So <clears throat> it's not all that difficult to take a structure like this and turn it into a DC tap. And as a matter of fact, we have somebody, and this is beyond my, my brain power, but who is working on a way to go directly to have a program that goes from your diagram 
to this. And how one does that, I don't know, but it would be great <laughs> if that happened. Um, it isn't terribly beautiful, but it, we, I can tell you that it works. We have programs that will take this and turn it into things like YAML and JSON. I'll talk briefly about more of that. You can get pretty detailed in your rules. You can say that author takes all of its uh, data from you know, idloc.gov. Uh, you can say this one has to be a string, this one has to be a year, this one has to be a mailbox. Um, and it, rather than going into anything more now, we are doing a tutorial on this on Thursday at uh, two o'clock Pacific time. It's one of the free sessions, so please <laughs> uh, let anyone you know <laughs> that you think might be interested in this or send this out to mailing lists, whatever. It's gonna be our first real tutorial. It's gonna be pretty informal and we aren't requiring people to know anything ahead of time. So uh, all of our work takes place on GitHub for this. Uh, we have a mailing list. So if you go to this GitHub address, you will see uh, all of our documents. And we have our, been documenting this really pretty thoroughly. You can join the mailing list. You can send us your data and ask if, if, you think, if we think we can profile it. And we actually have a large, uh, well, I feel like it's large because I did a lot of the work, but we have an entire directory of different examples of things that we have uh, worked out through using this format and uh, which has helped us understand what we do and don't need and areas that we might consider, you know, out of bounds, but has also helped us um, make uh, additions to this. We're getting close to being, I think, at a final product. And so we really wanna encourage people uh, to try this out. And the tutorial, uh, as I said, will be on Thursday. It's gonna be recorded and, um, and we're willing to do other tutorials if people would like. So that's it from me. Aaron, thanks so much. That was. We're, we're really on a roll. That was super interesting. I'm, I'm going to definitely be at that workshop. Um, <laughs> unless they chop one of these trees down and it falls on my house or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. really Let's hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, fantastic. Okay. Uh, Natasha, you're up next. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. Yeah, great. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first share my screen and make sure you can hear me. Okay. Very good. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am a mathematician by training, but I spend most of my life working with computer scientists. And um, my kind of primary area of expertise is um, uh, information technologies, uh, ranging from you know, typical data science tech, tech, text processing to deep learning methods that are now used in natural language processing. So this is one side of, say, my uh, my expertise, but um, over, over 12, 13 years now, I have been involved with the libraries and archives. First, a uh, couple of European projects and uh, also serving on the UNESCO Digital Preservation uh, Subcommittee, which is part of the Memory of the World program. So there, uh, on that side, really looking at the core issues in uh, long-term preservation of archives. So my presentation now, hopefully will complement what we have heard about the importance of metadata. But I will try to add to that three aspects. One is the, the nature of digital, because most of the metadata and the archives are now having at least some, some representation digital format. So it is really about understanding the nature of digital and how that affects the metadata and the um, description of artifacts that we need to have. The second thing is going to be about uh, uh, really the um, ecosystem play that requires long-term sustainability. And I'm then hoping to wrap this up with the ethical responsibility for long-term sustainability. So this kind of three elements, but let me start first pointing out that 
metadata is absolutely critical to find, to organize and find information or find digital artifacts. But then at that point, when we identify where they are, then we need to decide what's the best strategy to ensure access to it. And the, um, of course, if it is a physical artifact, um, what we do is you can walk to the shelf and get the book out, or you can decide to look at the digitized version. And this sort of digitization has been driven by many advances in uh, technologies, including digital, which requires to for scanned images to be then processed, say, you apply OCR to, to create a textual representation that can be searched and so on. So really fantastic work and so much has been done of creating this digital representation of physical artifacts. We have moved from books, we have moved through to 3D objects now. So even things that are not just written text, these are the uh, objects that we wish to preserve. And uh, um, in the future, who knows, they may be reproduced in some way. Replicas may be uh, created using 3D printing, for example. So there is always this intent to preserve uh, for some kind of um, experience of it. And the uh, physical one, of course, is there to be, to be pre presented either in a museum or a library or archive, whatever the setting is. But then the digital form there becomes almost a, another representation that is being experienced in the digital world. Uh, another aspect that's happening a lot now is when we combine um, elements of um, archive material, there may be um, uh, photos, for example, or there may be maps, or there may be records of um, uh, land. So one of the example is uh, excellent work by a Curtin University professor, Rina Tiwari. They engage in a 3D virtual um, reconstruction of the missions, of the sites where um, the children from the stolen generation were confined and spent their youth until they, they were released back into society. And they all carry with them uh, memories and um, often uh, very difficult memories. So the whole project was there to, to re-experience, to reconstruct and um, enable healing of this generation that needed to be able to uh, reconcile what happened to them. At the same time, this was a huge, um, of personal and national importance. But you see, this uh, documentary heritage has been created from whatever information could be gathered with the new technologies. So I'm just going to click on this uh, to show you where you can find information about this if you wish. This is basically a YouTube video which shows how they managed to uh, uh, reconstruct the places. And so now this is a video of the reconstruction. However, the real reconstruction enables you to navigate through the space. And the technology behind is very interesting. It's kind of a combination of a, 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 of a game engine um, with the uh, cultural material put all together. So now you have to ask yourself, so this is a, a, um, a derivative work, if you wish, of the um, uh, archival material that has been collected over time using new technology that created new documentary heritage. And then this needs to be preserved now. So the point here is this, all of these representations that are uh, um, important are now becoming in a digital form, but they're becoming more and more complex. So we needed metadata, of course, to um, um, describe them, but also think about how they will be accessed in the future. Now, going back, I, I showed you some kind of pro progression from, you know, uh, simple scanning to 3D scanning to uh, simulation to virtual environments. Now, just going back to the simplest form uh, to understand the, the, the very problem of access of digital artifacts. We are all focused on files and we all store files and we describe files. We describe what's in the files. So this is what goes into metadata and metadata themselves also um, is in, a, in the digital format. But those files, whether these are stored metadata files or um, a representation of artifacts, those files are not usable unless there is software. And so this sort of thing needs to be understood because this is the core issue with the access. So if this software that is uh, used to instantiate the file is not available, then we practically have stored something that's not accessible to a human being. And one may think, 
uh, well, for majority of stuff that you're interested in, like either scanned documents or written documents that are created with, uh, say, word, uh, word processing, we are fine. And most of the time we feel we are fine because we turn them into PDF and the PDF reader is available. So I just want to point out, this is sort of the almost a mask, which uh, masks the problem that in fact, um, if we didn't have this reader that's reliable, then we wouldn't be able to experience uh, this digital artifact. And now I'm gonna show you an example where sort of thing escaped and it represents a, a really huge um, um, event for people who are dealing with digital, and that's the obsolescence of Adobe um, Flash Player. Um, lots of uh, educational material has been created using Flash, and uh, lots of historical uh, and scholarly materials have been uh, leveraging Flash. Uh, it, there was, in fact, a whole revolution in 1990 started when the internet uh, um, was first adopted, and then uh, artists realized that they can create fantastic artifacts using flash player and uh, a virtual vermal is called virtual reality kind of uh, um, a modeling language. And one such artist is uh, um, Michael Takio Magruder, who is a really prolific artist and created lots of digital art over the 20 years. And among those arts are fantastic works of internet art. This is the generation that used the new medium and not just as, a, as art, but it's almost the whole movement of liberation. So historically, it's absolutely uh, critical to, 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 to remember this uh, very moment when artists uh, move from galleries to the whole world using the, uh, the browser and the technologies available for the browser. So uh, all this work now that depends on Flash is not accessible anymore. So I'm showing this as an example of an archive. This is an archive that is very carefully uh, curated by the artists in this instance. There's lots of metadata about the artifacts themselves. But the issue is that nobody can see this art anymore because um, Adobe had to pull the Flash Player from the market because it was non-secure and it couldn't maintain it anymore, couldn't afford to maintain it to make it secure. So now we have decades of uh, digital art affected. And uh, the particular artifact I want to show you here is called World. So we worked with uh, Michael because uh, Michael approached us to, to help. Uh, I'm, I have a company called Intac Digital and we have been working on a preservation software. So Michael contacted us to see whether we can do anything about Flash. And these are just a couple of still images that you can find if you go on, on the website and see Michael's stuff. So really nice, very, very intricate uh, sculpture in a 3D a space where it can rotate and you can see fantastic shapes. However, none of that can be experienced anymore. Now back to the metadata. If you really wanted to know what, how the digital art of it works, you need to document all the software that's involved. And that, 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 that sort of information is absolutely critical for any reconstruction that will happen of this digital art. And this is exactly what the, the, the key issue here was. The, the software needed to reconstruct to reinstantiate the digital artifact from this rich archive required a very systematic procedure, which would control a number of aspects that the artist insisted on. And that was the quality of it, how it looks, the stability of it, means the stable it can be seen um, consistently from in one instance to another, longevity, so that we know that whatever is in implemented can last for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And most importantly, it needs to be accessible through the same mode from the internet browser and need to be accessible to many. Because in the original form, it was just the access to the browser and we need to reconstruct the same. So I just want to say, um, in, when we're thinking about the metadata, we need to think about access after we find things, but also that access needs to be documented because that's absolutely critical for us to, to be able to provide uh, long-term. And all of that um, led us to this concept of on one side having archive, which is described as um, uh, stored um, 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 representations of the artifact. But on the other side, we need players for it. So that we call this uh, this pair or archive plus software library, where the software is that you all, all software that you need, we call that executable archive. And it doesn't matter whether it's a big or small. In this case, you see for, for, for Michael, this is a relatively small personal archive, but it requires the same thing. And so 
the issue uh, we need to solve in this case is that through the same kind of interface to the browser, you can easily uh, access the, the, uh, the original archives and then play it in the same way. So I will not, um, on some other occasion, I will have time to actually show you how this uh, works. But for now, I just want to point out uh, maintaining the software for archive uh, access is as elaborate as um, ingest of data into archive and metadata generation. In fact, for software li uh, li uh, library, if you wish to maintain it, you not only have to store all the uh, software files and metadata about software files, you need to also store all the information about the installations themselves and the maintenance, because the maintenance is an ongoing process. And this is not just a technology problem. In fact, if you map out this problem, there are five aspects. One is technology. Do Can I run this Flash player again with this stack of all the software that's required? But also, do I have licenses? Do I have um, licenses for the whole stack, from operating system all the way to, say, plug-in? And then there is the operation part. How are we going to allow people to have access to it? I mean, what would people need to um, be able to log in? This was about uh, access that was brought at the very beginning with a with a uh, you know South Korean archive. Do you just provide access to anybody, or in case of um, um, digital art, maybe galleries may want to um, control the archive and uh, the access. And then above all of that is about hu human factors. Do we remember how to use this? Can we uh, educate other people how to use it? Because if you look at the new generation, for them, this is all new. And they may laugh at us because the 3D modeling at that 20 years ago has nothing to do with the, you know, this wild games and shooting games that they're playing now. So this is very also very important thing to keep in mind. All of these are, uh, um, sort of connected to this quality assurance, whether we have a digital integrity of our digital archives. So I'm going to summarize this now. Um, on one side, really, if you're looking at the access, uh, the metadata is absolutely critical and probably need to be extended so that we can incorporate metadata about access. But the importance of software is um, undisputable. And so that component needs to come in. And we need to think about how the maintenance of software can be done because it requires technical expertise. And, and so we need to think about how to enable archivists and the users to, do, to base, enable this. The second bit is about ecosystem play. Uh, the reason why we've got problems with access is that um, inevitably software ages. And so it's, it's important to speak with the vendors who uh, are maintaining this essential components. And you may think, um, well, this is a problem of commercial software, but actually it's not. The same problem uh, is, is with open source communities, because if you if we don't speak with those people who are technically savvy and can create this uh, software for us and maintain it, then uh, we are really in a in, in situation where we cannot guarantee any access. We need to tell them how important um, uh, maintenance of software is and how critically damaging can be if they remove it from the um, market. That's really a matter of ethical um, um, considerations because yes, we are all for progress. We all want for the software to um, evolve, but at the same time, we can't remove things that can going to har harm uh, our capability of access. And the final point is the sustainability. So I just mentioned the one speak with vendors. This is all about technical, technological uh, uh, sustainability. Do I have the right software? Can I still see these things, or do I need to reshape the installation so that it become or maintain accessibility? But alongside that is the sustainability from the economical point of view, because just as you know, buildings cost and electricity in buildings cost, so does the infrastructure and the licenses and software for access. So we need to figure out what are the right business models that would enable long-term access, and of course not only access of the digital artifacts, but even the access to metadata, which is in a digital form. Yeah. Thank you very much, I'll stop here. That was fantastic, Natasha. Uh, I've heard pieces and parts of that before, but every time you do it, I get all excited. <laughs> uh, okay, well, this was fantastic. And I'll thank everybody um, who joined us from the audience. Hugh, I hope we got to your question. Um, and uh, thank you to all the participants and the organizers, Sam and your team, 
uh, this was a fantastic opportunity. So we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. with that, I'll close, close the Zoom session. All right, take good care, everybody. All the best. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.